So. Righto. A very warm welcome on the evening portion of a long day of the conference. Let me welcome you cordially on behalf of Heinrich Böll Stiftung, Brot für die Welt, Medico International and Pro Asyl. For those of you who were not here during the day, it was a program throughout the day, some will be sort of exhausted, but they're still here, which we're very happy about. And let me again warmly welcome all the new audience. Now, regarding the day where we were talking, return at any cost, migration policy, consult the reality and the situation of the countries of origin. I won't use much of your time and our time. I'll just briefly dwell on the topic that we've discussed long and wide. What does return mean and return policies of today's federal German politics and also at the European Union level? We looked at the contexts. Where are they taken back to? What's the situation on site in the home countries? What is counseling and consultancy supposed to be? And we dealt with, and this is what we'll embark upon more specifically this evening, what role does the ministry have in the course? Now, return and repatriation are not classic topics of development cooperation. And as we've discussed in the present migration policy, we have to look at these two fields of action and two fields of politics. Now, without more ado, let me pass over to Christine Helweg as a moderator. And thank you up front. One more thing on the live stream. And ich will Stiftung is just switching this event live. Not only you are the audience, but we also have an external audience, possibly. Oh, well, that's watching us live stream. Good evening. Good evening. And again, a great welcome to all of you on our discussion about Germans' migration policies and the question what role development cooperation might play or should play in this context. Now, many have been here during the day, but maybe tonight they'll have the opportunity also to just talk to those politically responsible, to ask them what makes sense, to check out also what is about illegal migration to be constrained. That is the declared purpose of the federal government on the one hand to deport rejected asylum seekers and voluntary return of migrants without a remain perspective. The measures that have been developed should be rolled out. We'll look at them specifically. We'll talk about the situation in some of the countries of origin to ascertain on what conditions it would make sense or would not make sense. And then we'll discuss the issue like measures and programs of development cooperation. Are they suitable for reintegration of migrants and supporting and assisting in the return of migrants. So I look forward to a lively debate that we'll be having up front together with our guests. We'll open that up to questions from among the audience. I have five guests whom I would like to introduce at the other end of the panel. That's Uwe Kekeritz, who's been on the Bundestag for Bündnis 90, the Greens. He's the Parliamentary Spokesman for Development Policy. Next to him is Bernhard Braune. He runs the Return Reintegration Level at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. In the middle, we've got warm welcome at home. Bente Scheller, she runs the Middle East North Africa desk in Heinrich Böll Foundation. Christian Klose, to your left, comes from the Federal Ministry of the Interior for Building and Community and runs the Return Division. And to my side is Hadi Marifa, Director of the Afghanistan Human Rights and Democracy Organization, who previously was an analyst and advisor and scientist working for a variety of organizations, among other things, for Human Rights Watch and the UN mission to Afghanistan and save the children. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. We like to begin with Syria, not because the current situation so requires, no, because the biggest group of refugees in 
recent years actually has come from Syria. Currently, we see that the northeast is destabilized by the Turkish invasion. But this is not what we're talking about, I promise. It's not the invasion. That's our topic. Rather, it's about the issue. What status do Syrians have in this country, actually? For Shella. Meanwhile, when the Syrians in 2014, 15, 16 came, they were generously granted asylum or a status under the Geneva Convention. And that seems to have changed doesn't it? How come and why? Thank you so much indeed. Yes, it has changed. At times, Germany used to be very generous in granting full protection status. In the recent years, it got restricted further and further, which has a massive impact indeed, not only that the protection they're granted now it has a close timeline for how long it's valid and constantly needs to be reviewed. They're subject to re reviews and the time, and that restricts that also the family reunion issue. The situation of those that escaped from the Syrian conflict has become more precarious than those, those that have come here, which is a big problem. We won't talk about the conflict as such, as such as you said, but I will promote that on 29 October. You can be back here, and they will be talking about the conflict as such. You've got to bear in mind what we've got here is a change in German policy making. Dealing with the developments in the country, this is not the background. It has not become any safer in Syria. Our assessment as to how long protection is to be granted, that has changed. But it's there's less fighting in Syria, that's true. Some of the regions have been calmed down. The government has been controlling those territories. And that's why the perception in the German public has come about. There's little fighting, less fighting, more security. Is that true for Syria? Well, there are fewer territories where the fighting goes on, but with the Northeast, a new territory has been included in the conflict, which used to be peaceful, largely peaceful hitherto. But let's not forget in Italy, there's two to three million people, and war just carries on unmitigated. In the recent months, again, the bombardment has been stepped up. I've been, I'm hesitant to talk about an end of the conflict, but with all these things, we have to see what we think is peaceful from an external perspective, because we don't see air bombardments. This is certainly not a safe harbor. And this is what refugees would need in order to return. No matter what poll you look at, security is a central issue. A minimum requirement should be available for a return perspective. This is not what we have in Syria. Insecurity, unsafe, is politically intended. The regime uses fear and fright as a, an instrument. That's why security from a regime perspective is not envisaged. Over 400 people disappeared last month alone in the regime territories. It is a cemetery sort of calm. Those that are there have no safety, and you can't say from the outside, with the best of their conscience, we can move people back there or send people back there, the, whose trace will be lost. So the problem is the regime and how it rules. The risk still exists that people get arrested when they return, in particular if they're under general suspicion, many that have fled here, because they were opposition people, say. True, true, yes. Uh, there's a big multitude of militias, gang-type activities in the regime territory who control large areas. You shouldn't imagine that there's a central power to control everything. I mean, that does exist, the regime, with extra extremely mighty intelligence agencies, secret services that can persecute people, that can prosecute people, that can kill people. But there's a splintering of the regime areas where regime control basically is disrupted and all sorts of power actors are around who have their own interests that they pursue. Partly politically motivated, but also economically motivated. They see, well, somebody who's been away in Germany all the time, maybe you can rip him off Make a bit of money. It's a situation that bears a lot of risks for civilians. Also in other areas where you have armed actors all around that have a say in other parts of the country, you can't say there is any area where you would safely have a structure in place which is not dominated by actors that are weapon-bearing. It's not an option for civilians. 
Now, there's a report, a situation report from the Foreign Office that plainly describes all these risks and hazards, unusually clearly as a Foreign Office report, but still there's a push from the Federal Office for Migration to reduce protection. There was a fear amongst Syrians that they got invited to review their status this spring. This was downgraded or meant to be downgraded to be subsidiary protection or only a stop from deportation. How come that your ministry or the authority in your control rates it differently from the Foreign Office? Well, first, that's not true that there were a different rating. The federal government has a uniform rating, and the BAMF goes by the situation report of the Foreign Office. The general source of findings is the Foreign Office. And so far, there is no difference. Fashella played made it plain. There is a situation that in Syria may change, that does change. Now, of course, a new dramatic turn has been taken. But let me say up front, since 2011, there's been a stop of uh, getting back to people back to Syria. This is not with inside the Council of uh, Interior Ministers agreed to extend that. No deportation rule until the end of the year. It will be back on the agenda. And if there's no change in the situation there, it will be carried on this way. How do you explain the bump communication? Well, that aside, there is no return, forced return. What we do have is a voluntary return, which we do not propagate. The federal government does not propagate that, but de facto, it does take place. We see it. You can say you can't let them leave. That would be difficult for Syrian nationals to be prevented from leaving the country if they so wish. Now, there are people who have their own interests who take responsibility and take a decision to return because they have findings maybe from acquaintances and relatives that for them, obviously, the situation is not hazardous. I'm not going to rate that or judge on that. It is a fact that people do return in a significant number voluntarily, but we don't propel it. We only subsidize it as in the field of voluntary return programs, a uh, repayment of costs is a possibility. Another question is where people come from Syria and seek protection. They come to Germany. Then, of course, we have and practice indeed has changed and the conflict also has changed uh, on, since the 2015 migration and refugee crisis, the individual threat is analyzed. With the individual persecution, the refugee status is considered. Yes, it is a possibility. It's also granted, but increasingly we have subsidiary protection or possibly no deportation as a decision. That is due to the individual case. And uh, this is more using the present law for the federal office. But the impact for those concerned is arbitrary, right? Depending on what state you're in, depending on what the administrative courts have ruled, depending on what they rule on refusals, those that refuse conscription. The one state says it's a reason not to be returned. Another one says, oh, well, you can send them back. Um, it's a regular army of the Syrian state where there's conscription. So from the point of view of the Syrians, it is sort of a lottery. Where am I? Who summons me to appear? And what does that agency decide that has led to lots of insecurity? Well, it's not the Syrian or the Syrian man or woman. That's an individual process, everybody that seeks protection is judged on the merits of his own reasons and case, and he gets the status as is envisaged in the law. So the question is, is somebody individually concretely threatened by the regime, then certainly he will receive refugee status, where as part of the general population, he is threatened by a war subsidiary protection comes into question or a no deportation rule. That follows the individual situation. It does not follow a master instruction. No. It's the result of the decision-making practice in thousands of cases by jurisdiction. Thank you. Re addressing the voluntary return matter. Well, we've talked about it for other countries. Let me get back to Afghanistan together with Herr Malifat. Afghanistan sort of is one step fair. The biggest parts of the country were declared safe years ago. How safe has Afghanistan become, just generally speaking? Uh, 
for those of you that the, you were this morning here, I actually set a little bit, you know, the political security context of the country in the wake of recent development and changes that happen um, uh, and, and, and might be repetitive for some of you, but I am still uh, would like to add some more points uh, to what I already mentioned. Uh, to start, uh, I mentioned this morning that there is an active war going on in 32 provinces out of 34 provinces of the country. And these two provinces is still caught in, let's say, in the middle of the conflict zone, where the route you know, to these provinces are not safe. So literally, so we talk about two provinces in the entire country that is safe. According to SIGAR, which is the office of the special investigator for the construction of Afghanistan, so they have come with this report that nearly 50% of the country is either controlled or contested by the insurgency, the Taliban. And on top of that, one particular actor that has been recently added to, let's say, the conflict theater in the country is the ISKP, the Islamic State for Khorasan province. The threat of Islamic State for Khorasan province is often underestimated you know, for many years, and it has not been taken seriously. And now we know that it is actually a serious threat. The group is capable of orchestrating you know, and, 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 and operating even in the cities and organizing multiple attacks that are conducted, including in the capital, Kabul, targeting particularly you know, the minorities, uh, uh, both also in the capital but uh, in different other provinces. And also uh, in the eastern province of Nangarhar, we, uh, and that has literally turned into the, the stronghold or heartland of the ISKP for now for many years. I myself have did, uh, you know, done a search and went there for the first time that we have talking about ISKP arrival in Afghanistan. And even at that time, despite the warning and despite you know, a multiple times that it has been mentioned, the threat of ISKP has not been taken seriously. But now, as you know, like three days ago, they, 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 they conducted a, you know, a horrific attack in, in one of the districts in a mosque that over 85 people were killed and hundreds were injured in that. So now we know that ISKP is actually a, a, a threat and a very serious threat that has to be, despite the fact that also we have rhetoric and statements coming that, well, we have defeated and the ISKP. And of course, the Afghan government is saying, you know, and you know that the mother of bomb actually dropped uh, and one of the uh, stations or headquarters in the same province that I talked about in the east, but despite the fact, and it is still a long way, you know, to go, uh, uh, and of course, uh, defeat, you know, such a resilient force, you know, that has, you know, uh, 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 a connection with transitional uh, terrorist network uh, around the region that we speak. So, and speaking of, you know, certain, uh, uh, and the capital Kabul, of course, you know, there's some, something that has been considered before SIF, and now, you know, by you know, one report actually, and it's a very quite credible uh, uh, source that has said over 200 incidents, security incidents, and of course the small and big incidents that happened, you know, alone in 2000, since the beginning of this year in Kabul. And of course, 28 of these incidents happened on a humanitarian organization such as NGO. So this is actually the situation that we are dealing at the moment and in the country. Uh, so I would certainly sure, you know, say that there is not you know, literally a safe space in Afghanistan that you could send you know, deportees that they could be safe and, they, and, they, and that they are you know, like without risk of being killed in any particular, no matter whether it is in the urban areas or in the rural areas. Because before we have been talking about rural areas as the bulk of, let's say, this conflict was taking place and now it has actually come to the cities because it is more you know, particularly for this kind of campaign and others that the terrorist network and such as the Taliban are doing is to get more attention, more attacks are happening in the cities, as I mentioned, particularly in Kabul and also some other major cities. Nevertheless, in many of the deportation flights, there are a lot of Afghans. The population seems to think there are lots of Afghans who are deported. There are major campaigns to prevent that happening. Indeed, there are about 257,000 Afghans, out of whom 19,000 uh, have to leave, have to be deported, and 565 have only been deported as a small share by April this year. Any deportation is a drama indeed, yes, also in the case of Afghanistan, in view of the situation that these people are going into. What happens to the people there when they leave the plane? Well, uh, 
according to our study, uh, a number of, of course, you know, the percentage that I have given this morning, and uh, so I would be more happy to go back to those percentage, that a lot of them, you know, do not go back to the place of origin, you know, the places that they originally coming to the provinces. And some of them alternate between their places of origin and the capital and some of the cities that they stay. And a number of them also leave the country. You know, they go back to Iran. And as I mentioned also that, uh, you know, some of these people, you know, that they, are, they have come to Europe, they didn't come from Afghanistan, you know, because these are the Afghan refugees that have been living in Iran for years, you know. And after, you know, the sort of sanctions on Iran and particularly with economic situations over there, so we have as a result seen some of them traveling or moving you know, to Europe. Uh, and then, so they had to go back, you know, to, they had to go back where their families are actually in Iran and thus they lived and they grown up there. And I have to say that some of them in Afghanistan, they do not have the network. And, 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 and in a country like Afghanistan, I have to clearly mention that having a social network is very important, you know, to, for you to survive. When these people are coming here and having no connection and no network, there is no way for them to survive in a difficult and harsh environment such as in Kabul and other places. So they have to go back for the places in order to get some support from the family. And let allow me actually to also mention that the the deportees are actually one of the most indebted community that we talked in Afghanistan. And our research shows that when we have estimated the cost of 40, uh, 40 depo, you know, uh, immigrants to, to Europe, and it is over half a million dollars that they have spent to come to Europe. And the average is actually 11,000, something 11,500,000, ,500, which is 17 times more than per capita income in the country. And then the higher cost that actually that they have paid, it is 40 thousand dollars and that means you know that they had worked all their life you know to earn forty thousand dollars some of them if they had properties they have sold their properties you know and then that, to take this difficult journey to come to Europe and now they are actually one of as I said the most indebted community in the country and then our research shows that 78 percent of the people that we have talked in and they deported from Europe they remained unemployed in the country and only 7% of them, you know, that they, they, they were able, you know, to, to, to be self-employed, even but they, they were not employment opportunities for them. So in the wake of that kind of situation, so absolutely there is no way for them to stay in the country and there is not possibility, you know, for employment and there is, a, of course, a danger to their life. So they have to go back to either Iran or Pakistan. And some of them, of course, also mentioned that they will come back to Europe because that's, and it's still, they say that it was actually not properly you know, known how they have been ended up in Afghanistan because, you know, nobody explained to them the process and nobody told them and a lot of them believed that it was maybe a mistake, you know, so I have to go back. And of course, I maybe one last last point, you know, that when they are actually arriving in the country, when some of them we met at, at the airport, and the first question is ask, uh, they are asking, where is the German embassy? Where is the Norwegian embassy? I want to go actually there and talk because there was a mistake. I was caught by a police and when they were deported there, and I wasn't, it was actually a forced return. It was not a voluntary one. And then it takes some time to explain to them the first thing that we have been telling to them that no, now you're in Afghanistan, you're back. You cannot even get Kilometer, a kilometer close to their embassy because they're protected by walls and all that that you know. So there is no way that you could go and somebody will be there and to explain to you. And slowly, I think in some of them for that, it is completely in a shock that it takes even two weeks and three weeks and even a month to finally realize that no, they are deported and they are now back to in Afghanistan. Vielen Dank. Für Thank you very much for this very impressive uh, explanation also from a personal point of view. If we have a look at the situation in Germany, we always think that the wrong people are being deported. Uh, those who have a, a direct, an, an address, uh, people who are getting a training, professional training, or even a pregnant woman who was at hospital. And uh, we have the impression that uh, it's a personal hardship that uh, is being caused, or if people undergoing a training, it's not being taken into account. So these bureaucratic decisions, which might be correct, uh, but we just want to have a high rate of uh, deportation. And if I find that Afghan person at his uh, professional training center, then we can take him. And that is really a frustration for all those voluntary organizations with whom I work. And they say, why can we not really find 
the perpetrators of crimes. We now deport uh, some people who are just undergoing a training, and we have gone through all this bureaucratic, uh, uh, all those bureaucratic difficulties. Why can we not be more human or if more efficient? Because somebody who is learning a, pro a training, getting a training, and is being deported uh, when our Minister of Development goes to Mexico to try to get people for vocational training. Well, I do understand what you are talking about, but it's not r correct. And I have to state that very clearly, because we had a security incident at uh, the embassy, and we have uh, introduced a re uh, restriction for people who try to pretend a different identity than the real one they have. So people who are being repatriated are in most cases, perpetrators uh, who have become perpetrators in, in Germany. And that is a prioritization done by the uh, federal states. And the other group, the well-integrated peop people, uh, will have a possibility to uh, have a better chance to stay. The legislator has made that possible. And uh, they can get a uh, medium-term stay. So integration performance can be recognized. And there have been possibilities for Afghans uh, previously who did not have any status. And now the recognition rate is, uh, has changed. At first it was 70 percent, now it's only 40 percent. So all these people get their protection here. And of course they are available for the labor market. They can integrate and we want them to integrate. But those, and that is important to keep as a social consensus, those who were uh, perpetrators and uh, lost their uh, right to stay in Germany have to leave. And that is not a surprise. You get a notice, it's being explained to you. Even legal assistance is a procedure that can take two or three years. But people know that they are obliged to return. And we offer them also counseling to for voluntary returns, which we want to promote. So it can't be a big surprise. If the notice uh, arrives, then the uh, repatriate, uh, repatriation is done almost as a homeopathic uh, drop. Because if we have uh, more than 100,000 uh, people who are obliged to leave the country and we have only a much lower number, and we do take into account the public opinion and also the enforcement agencies of the federal states, uh, which get our support from the national government. But of course, there's a legal protection, even the constitutional court uh, is included. So we have to implement and enforce the law. And when they arrive, we just don't drop them uh, there. Mm, never, we do uh, offer psychosocial services. The IOM is there, the migration office is there. We give support to travel further to the region of origin and many other uh, services. But if you compare to with other countries, and if I see our neighboring countries, they have a completely different uh, policy to repatriate Afghans. And I don't want to, that to happen here. In Turkey, for example, has uh, returned uh, less than 20,000 people. But we would like to motivate the people who have to leave the country to do that voluntarily. And the last means, especially for uh, perpetrators of crimes, uh, need to be uh, returned by force. But uh, that's a due to security reasons uh, for the federal government of Germany, it is not possible to have your own counseling service there. Well, but uh, the last time I was in Kabul in June, of course, I have protection around me. Uh, that is logical because I might become a target of the as a member of the international community, and uh, I'm not a uh, normal Afghan. There are 35 million of Afghans uh, living there, and not everywhere the conflict is uh, 
uh, happening. And in June, things were much more positive. When I saw the numbers of UNAMA, if I just look at the first uh, half year, the victims of civil violence were uh, at the level of 2012 and 2013. But there's a but in the last uh, three months, we see and observe that uh, in the environment of the pre presidential elections and the failed negotiation process with the Americans, there is an increase of such attacks. And of course, unfortunately, in the uh, area of um, wounded people, many people of the civil society are affected. So that's the level of 2015-16. So the report on the situation of the Foreign Office should be adapted to this to these changes. Well, if you have a look at it, they speak about a volatile security situation. Well, that is exactly the point. You cannot say, and we have never said, that this region is completely safe. But there might be safe areas, and that has to be done on an individual basis. In Panjshir and Banyan, it is more safe than in Kandarbaga on other areas. There are regional differences which can be pointed out also statistically. But uh, we have to check it uh, on an individual basis. What is the ethnic uh, origin of a person which plays a role when we check the situation? So we agree that it's difficult to enforce deportation, that they cost a lot of money, and they're not desirable. So the new focus is now put on voluntary, voluntary return or assisted return with counseling and uh, material incentives. That has not completely succeeded. We have a look at the number of returnees. They have gone down. It's 240,000 people in Germany who are obliged to leave the country. In 2018, it was 16,000 immigrants uh, who went back voluntarily. And the development ministry has initiated a program, perspective to return to your country of origin. So could you explain us what is the idea behind this program? I'll be happy to do this. Our approach is the reintegration work in the country of origin, if it's a development country, is a job of development cooperation because these are steps. It requires measures that traditionally we have anchored in development cooperation, professional qualification, support in finding work, supporting people in establishing their own firm or going independent, but also social psychosocial support. All these are measures which are not a one-time financing option, but this is a lengthy process which is required. That's why this is something that we have in our range of jobs and programs. So this is one thing I meant to say up front, that you should look at a reintegration measure what you would see is not significantly different from what you would see with the local population anyway. So our program perspective homeland is laid out this way, that we have the local population that we've included in our most and returnees, men and women, not only from Germany, also from other third countries in Afghanistan, for instance, from Iran and Pakistan and in other countries, for instance, in Western Africa, where we happen to be just recently uh, also lots of returnees from Libya who are encompassed by our program. So that we've never have a program exclusively for returnees from Germany. The reintegration programs, however, in order to be successful, need to have a structure. Uh, for this, it takes, again, the classic development policy approach. It takes state partners with whom we can cooperate. In Northern Africa, for instance, these are the ministries of labor who have quasi an employment agency uh, function in Tunisia, it's NETI, in Morocco, UNAPEC where you were the other day. In other countries, we identify other partners because there are different preconditions. 
in Western Africa, there is not such a employment agency that we could cooperate with. It's rather the ministerial structures which are available for us. But we try and find an approach to structure things there as well. And that's why the state partner is an essential precondition for us. And supplementarily, we have civil society partners. They can make offers that are beyond the classic vocational training and vocational qualification. Talking about social reintegration programs, for instance, which I can specify more, we do this generally with civil society partners. And my third point, while we're en route in return and reintegration, it's, it's such a complex process that no partner or no organization can do it all alone, not even IOM, not even BAMF, and not the BMZ either, the Development Ministry, not even GIZ, I would say. It takes networks for a successful voluntary return and sustainable reintegration. We epitomize it, but talking from Baden-Württemberg to Banjul, forming a chain of returnees, it's a contested term, yes, it's under attack. It depends from the first reception by the Freiburg government in sticking to Gambia and Baden-Württemberg, who are in charge of the first reception, the first intake, and then it goes to the Karlsruhe uh, Presidium, who are in charge of a return. We'll have to talk with the land ministries of the individual federal states. We'll have to talk with the BUMF, with the interior ministry, and they have not even left Baden-Württemberg yet. And we talk with the state partners in the Gambia. We talk about, like our project, for instance, the European Union that co-finances the program. And at some point, we're in the vocational training center in Mansakonka, which we've built up, where for the local population and for returnees, we offer professional vocational qualification for agricultural machine construction and solar technology for people to have a qualification and a perspective for a job. At the end of the long chain, this is classic development cooperation indeed. But the idea has been that people are returned and that with the counseling services on site, you keep people where they are, right? The idea of migration is a negative one, isn't it? Migration. No one need to, no one need to contradict. No one contradict. We see migration rather as a neither positive nor negative thing. It's a social phenomenon as such, which can be both negative and positive, you know? And from my point of view, what matters is how it's being shaped. It's not our job to prevent migration. Quite important, quite important. Our job is to look at migration options, to provide counsel, to provide advice in our centers. That's why I say 360 degree advice. These are not return centers, no longer that is. These are centers that give counsel on legal, migration options, but also on remain options, but that also advise on the risks of irregular migration. And this certainly, as I find, is a holistic approach indeed. This is our claim to have it and offer it. Herr Kirchhoff says the job of development cooperation, development policy is not the return of migrants, right? Uh, to support that or facilitate it, what would you say? The BMZ with the implementation by GIZ, isn't it serving, in that case, a restrictive migration policy? How would you rate it? Quite, quite, this is my judgment as well. Yes, it's a restrictive migration policy. Quite clearly, yes, it is. The BMZ and the strategists in the government need not imagine that this way they can be successful. Well, they say they provide advice on legal migration path. They show them. Uh, in, I was in Senegal, I was in Morocco, in the nick of the time they're through, because the legal migration options are so limited. And those that actually uh, want to come to Germany through a legal structure, go to Germany or Europe, don't know, don't need that institution. They would find a way anyway without that. Uh, so I'm wondering what this advice is meant to provide. That's the one thing. On the other hand, also the vocational training can be seen as a positive 
development, sure, no doubt. I've looked at advice centers in Morocco and in Senegal. Only people from home, not from Germany, no returnees at all. So they couldn't show me anybody. They said there were such, but on the day when I was there, and they knew I would be coming, they knew on time, in time, they were not in a position to drum up somebody to show me. But I asked around what that training looks like. You see, I don't want to run down that training facility. These are the simplest kinds of work that people are trained for. Just imagine in the nick of time, the shortness of time, I don't know for how long it takes to be trained for a qualified job. Looking at German conditions, you will know, two and a half, three years, three and a half years, then you have a good apprenticeship training. I mean, that's not realistic to expect that in the target countries, but over two months, three months is not what they offer. And it's been my impression indeed that it's neither Neither is there any tr training, it is only advice. We've met people there to open up a barber's shop. Have you been to Africa? There are thousands of hairdressers and everybody without our consultancy centers. I don't know how they ever came about doing that on their own. Or you meet somebody there on place who has some goats that he wants to breed. Well, we from Germany need to come and invest so that they can raise goats or somebody who wants to go for a chicken farm. An enormous demand, sure, it's a good thing where such offers are made, yet, yet, you know, they can do it, all right. It has nothing to do with voluntary return or with what you've been propagating as a prospective homeland. Nothing to do with it. This is something you could do much, much cheaper and more favorably. Again, a critical query. The problem is migration policy and less the return counseling in some countries where there is no remain perspective from the beginning because Germany has defined migration in such a way that if you come from Senegal or you come from Ghana, these are safe countries of origin by definition. Those that come illegally definitively have no option to stay. This is to say our problem is that these young people are in an anchor center for months in Bavaria. And then maybe it does make sense to say, uh, I'll talk with that young man in the beginning and check out what can you do, what do you want to do, do we have a plan, how can we help you to return and become something there, then spend time here, waste time here. There may be individual countries where such guidance, where such counseling makes sense. It would be desirable that we would not need it because from the very beginning in the countries we had to talk with the people and had offered other options of legal migration. I mean, that's the core problem, right? That there there's no regular migration that is envisaged from those countries unless you want to study in Germany or you marry a German. Or maybe in the future it will improve by the Immigration Act for experts. We'll get to that later again. Isn't it migration policy, which is restrictive by definition, isn't that the problem? Unless the GIZ staff will really try to cover and give guidance to hopeless cases. That's what I tried to explain. This is the very big problem we've got. When you ask what the task of development policy is, this is not defined as sending people back. Where Germany, in the majority, decides we have a rigid return policy, then you can discuss it. But it cannot be that money from development corporation, corporation is you misused, is misspent because it's lacking elsewhere to help in the development countries to build up reasonable structures. The alpha and omega, of course, is legal migration paths are lacking. That's why I said consultancy is two minutes or maybe five minutes as far as this is concerned because they do not exist and federal government should stand by it, move over and offer legal migration paths. It's not that difficult. Ebona, who else should do it, Herr Kekeritz, that reintegration work? Who else? You see, I can well imagine that the federal government has a problem 
there are people we want to get rid of, and now we go about it and say development cooperation is to do it. I am firmly convinced that different approaches are necessary. For instance, we could wonder, why do so many people come here? What have we failed to do over the past 60 years? What has been done positively so that people would have a perspective? And the other thing is, sure, the better developed the country is, the more migration will there be. Young people simply, like in Germany, want to leave the country, go to the US, go to England, go to France and check out and get training there, develop themselves further there, and they will come back. You call it a circular migration, quite a positive effect, but we're blocking all of that. And if you decide indeed to go for it, then not at the expense of development cooperation. We have the 07 target. We've had it since 1960 or 62. For 40 years, no, 70s rather, we've promised we will not reach that game, that aim. We're now at 0.5 percent of GDP, GDP, but where money is spent on organizing return and repatriation, we're on a much, much lower level. And we will never reach the 0.7% target. I have to clarify a lot. We don't organize returns. Return is a technical thing, the deportation. This is what the Home Office does. We're in charge of reintegration measures. We're talking about the development budget now. We're in charge of reintegration measures. And again, let me stress that. I'll answer my own question. For the permanent measure on site to be provided in the classical range of development policy, that is professional qualification, vocational training, support in going independent. You sort of ridiculed it now. Any establishment of a business may fail. The success prospects are better, whether it's a business plan, whether it's a qualified financing. This is what we're offering. And again, I see this as development policy task. And that aside, I may also comment one more point. And I'll be happy to also quote Herr Claus, Christian Claus, largely as a result of prevailing law, that people have to go back to their home countries where they have no entitlement to remain in this country. And then the question remains open, do we bother, do we care for them if they go down that road, or do we leave them on their own and alone? And the development policy approach is to really bother and to care for returnees so that this will become a more successful reintegration. It's easy to wreck and ruin such programs by shouting them down and saying it's all rubbish. No, it's an important task for us. And again, we link it to the work for more remain perspectives, as we call it. And along those lines in development policy, I have no problem at all. Farshella, did you want to? Oh, oh, sure, I want to respond right away. Since when have we had this program? after 2015. It's strange that we have refugee migration, such a wave, let me call it, as 2015, and then suddenly the economics nor the cooperation ministry says that is what development policy requires. I was in Africa myself. I spent two years in development policy, but rather I was a development assistance on site. And I taught classes. You could say, well, that's important. If they can read and write and reading, writing, arithmetic, if they learn how to calculate. And, but at the time, this was closed down with a reason. What about it? German experts come and they teach 30, 40 high school students. That is not building up structures. Let me ask you, where indeed is the structural build up? It's my impression from time to time that development policy here moves over to picking out one student, one pupil, and giving him remedial classes. We should query that. We should question whether this is a development approach. I'm not denying that for the individual that may be meaningful where he is promoted for, say, three months and then gets a job. But the question crops up whether through that measure 
that in terms of cost cannot be topped at all if that is meaningful, if that is sensible. As I said earlier on, there are also other methods for hairdressers and barbers. They build each other themselves. They have done so for decades. They don't need consultancy centers from Germany. Fraschella, I guess I meant to go back to the obligation to leave the country. Yes, it does exist, but there's also a right to asylum and a right to protection. And that's not backed up as the obligation to return. So you yeah, would see there are people in a place where they require protection, but they cannot legally go here, come here. That's a problem you should look into when you think about organizing people leaving. You should also see how can we organize legal immigration in a larger degree for those that have a right to come. There is a need for doing so. We're in this question, what can development cooperation do? Is it done wrongly? Is it a panacea? But I think that you forget too easily that migration is a different thing from escape, from fleeing, from seeking refuge against the necessities of life. You fear for your life, and that's why you come here. That's a totally different perspective. When we talk about, think about that, how to grant this protection, and questions of is it useful shouldn't play a role. Is that a nurse that seeks protection. Can we use a nurse here as a debate that we cannot carry on this way? We will not be able to keep these people anywhere, want it or not, by coming up with some measures to combat the root causes of escape. Now, the recent years that has led us into development is pushed into this field as if you could move big things this way. No, we should rather think about what in terms of development policy have we done wrong? No, all in all politically, so that we have so many contexts from which people have no other alternative left but to escape, who are forced into boats across the Mediterranean, whom we force into illegality because we're not opening the gates. They're not fleeing because they don't have a job in their country. No, they flee because they are persecuted individually or as a group and because they cannot know, they don't know if they're on a list of the government. It's not envisaged. They cannot foresee how you can get to the horizon of the uh, murder machines, like in Syria. Of course, thank you. That was the attempt quite clearly at separating. We're not talk about doing, talking about the right to asylum. People who are individually persecuted. That's not under dispute that these people, aside from if they're useful for us, get protection, shall get protection. And Germany, with our own past, is well advised to stick to the asylum right and not to mix it up with other purposes. That takes us to the drama that people come from so-called safe countries, that is, countries that are democratically, have democratic governments, for instance, make an asylum petition, they must do so. That is so senseless in migration policy, which basically forces everybody to illegally pay all his fortunes to the human traffickers to get you through the Mediterranean, you make an asylum petition somewhere because he's not entitled to asylum. That's the big difference that we must make in the debate between migration that is a natural phenomenon, optimal for all people, a circular migration, it should be possible. People want to develop further by going this place or the other place for a few years. That goes without saying in Europe. For most people, that does not go without saying. But again, there's the other reason that Bente has agreed, has approached we should talk about in the case of Syria of Afghanistan. Let me return to the reality of the advice centers in Germany, where, for instance, the absurd situation comes up that the young person is receiving counsel, and you find out, oh gosh, super, the young person from Nigeria, he could go into vocational training here and even have a company who would take him over, but he's got to go back first because then he's got to go to the embassy and apply for a visa. So I need to send him back, but I can't even help him with the return program because then he would have to pay back the money. And uh, that is the absurd German bureaucracy where you ask, why can this person, this young man who was rejected his asylum procedure, claim, why can we not give him a chance with a training 
um, place in a company. And there are Iranians, Afghans who have gotten a contract or who have been working as nurses. So people say, OK, go back to Dakar, go to the German embassy, we prepare everything. Is it not a possible to do that in a different way, Mr. Close? It is possible. The question is, uh, is it advisable to do it in this way? That's a question how migration management is being done by Germany and other target countries which have a certain profile regarding employees that can be taken into the labor market. I do agree that uh, flight and migration has to be uh, looked at in a different way. But uh, with the refugees, it's uh, not only a question of uh, work permit. The integration approach that we pursue in, in Germany is different when people want to enter the labor market. And you have uh, explained what it means to get a qualification, a training in Germany, and to be allowed to work here. So people, when they're born here, they go to school when they are six. And uh, later on, they get a professional training, and then they start their job. But then they have already spent uh, 12 years in the education system. Now, if it's a university degree, that uh, something that you get after social socialization after uh, 15, 16 years uh, to just start uh, your work on the labor market. So that is a challenge for people who come from outside this education system, which is uh, huge. In the last 10 years, a lot of things have changed in the area of work migration. But the profile was created on purpose because you want to find people for a labor market who have the required qualification. And that is often the mistake in the debate that they say that those who are here should the people who fulfill the qualification. And in general, they don't. So in the end, it would mean that all the education uh, investment would have to be done still for these people. What, what happens uh, with those who abide um, by the law? Because the idea is that the qualification is not uh, done in Germany. It's partly done abroad. And there are different possibilities of legal immigration also for academic uh, or qualified professions. And with a new law of uh, uh, allowing for professionals to come in, well, it's not yet approved. But uh, the law is not the problem, because we have had a liberalization of the work migration over the last 10 years. And the OECD has confirmed that situation. But who fulfills the qualification requirements? Well, if the requirements are so as high that nobody can fulfill them, then it's not possible. No, but nobody would have want to employ somebody who speaks uh, bad English. Uh, you need for a certain profession, a certain job, uh, certain qualification requirements. Le leave me, let me say the following. If you want to go to a professional training school in Germany, you need uh, German as a B2 uh, level. So only when people have acquired this level, then they can start uh, this uh, vocational training. And uh, that is the reality in, in Germany. If you want to lower the level, that's a different thing. But you want to train qualified people who can, are available to the German labor market. Well, you are doing a kind of salto mortale. Before, we deported people because they, uh, they uh, were criminals. And now you want to repatriate them because they don't have the level two. Uh, they don't have the level two of German knowledge. Well, in my little district in Bad Winsheim, I know young people who did have a place at a vocational training center. The employer was ready to give them a training and as a politician far away in Berlin, I don't have to worry about uh, them managing it or not. If the employer has trust in this young person, these young people, then we should also give them that trust as politicians. I know that uh, 
an Afghan who had been working in a special painting uh, uh, shop, and he paid uh, taxes, social insurance, has a, had his own apartment, and was a member of a football club. And then they took away his work permit. And now you talk about uh, these people having to have a certain qualification and integration performance. But these are just some uh, uh, examples. And there are hundreds of them. And that is a very destructive approach. And the Mr. Ziofa now speaks a different language. But the politics has not changed at all. Well, let's have a look at how the measures of this new program are supposed to work. It's about uh, returnees that who should be reintegrated. You would reintegrate them in their countries of origin. And then the idea is that they would find a job. And you said in your report that there were uh, 1,400 measures to get people back to work. These are returnees that are not working, or are these just measures to try to provide them with a job? Well, to uh, try to find jobs for them, it's about uh, in 2018, 2,400. These are not the measures. These are individuals who found a job. Because there are other numbers from uh, the middle of the year in Ghana, and there was nobody who got a job. In Senegal, it was one. In Ghana, six. So in Kosovo, there were 749 returnees who found a job, because there's a different kind of cooperation with Kosovo, with targeted uh, um, professional training programs, and also the language training is well done. So to conclude this argument, now there is a double number of Kosovars who come to Germany than those who are being sent back. That would be a successful migration policy, wouldn't it? Well, we want to see successes that provoked by the Federal Republic of Germany. Well, why does it work with Kosovo and not in Morocco, Nigeria, or Senegal? Well, let me say something about the numbers. Why in the middle of 2018 those numbers were so low? That is due to the fact, the following fact, and I have to refer to the GIZ. It is an organization that also needs time to implement measures. We need to work with the different governments of those countries on how to implement these programs. That takes time. You have to manage the programs, and that requires time and money. And therefore, the numbers from the middle of 2018 in some countries are quite low. But recently, at the end of 2019, this number has substantially increased. And we are quite confident that these measures can be managed uh, in a proper way. And basically, every voluntary returnee can be offered a counseling talk. That was 2,400 last year, right? 2,400 got a job. No, 2,400 counseling talks were carried out. That is the number from taken from your report. Well, it's really not such a high number. Well, maybe that's now going too much into the details if we start reading out numbers. Uh, the point is that we have established a good process. We can reach out to the returnees. They come to our counseling centers. And then is an individual talk with those people. We ask them, what is your idea? What do you want to do? What is your biography? Uh, you're a hairdresser. Do you want to become a hairdresser or uh, work uh, um, to, to breach and chicken? Uh, so the talk, which is very much criticized by some people, is a very important measure. Because only if you can deliver information to people, they can take an informed decision and an independent decision. So that's why I put the focus on this counseling talk. But that 
situation, the help has to go on because counseling is not enough. And that might be that we accompany the person to get him into a training if there are, are difficulties uh, regarding their social situation to stabilize uh, the conditions. And then it's a difference if you just uh, put up some wooden stand or if you get a certain financing to create your company. And another possibility is to give somebody a professional training because his wish cannot be implemented uh, with the qualification he has or she has. And we have good numbers. Uh, we have worked with quite a lot of people and uh, the returnees from Germany can be offered these uh, aids. So Mr. Kikowitz wanted to say something. I also wanted to include another point, uh, which is the question if the training of people who apply for a job in Iraq really gets them uh, a living a job to make a living. For example, in Senegal, the European uh, fishing quotas have destroyed the fishery jobs or our agricultural policy in the EU makes it impossible that a sustainable agriculture can uh, be created uh, in Africa. So they basically were submitted to our economic interests and that wa won't work either. So the question is if development cooperation also there's responsibility to give people a chance on the ground and not just uh, give them a business plan for a startup and some counseling. So my question is, is it not necessary in Tunisia or Somalia to have more accompanying measures to develop the, the economy on the ground? The governor said, well, this counseling center on the ground is not really necessary. We don't need a training how to apply for a job. We need jobs. And uh, the Federal Republic has financed a lot of measures uh, in the north of Iraq and Mosul. I don't know where these funds went to, but uh, our development cooperation in Africa or other countries needs to be efficient to really give jobs to people. But Mr. Kikor, I just want to add something. Well, of course, counseling is a very important matter, but Something is important. A talk is a talk. Counseling is something else. I've been working for 10 years in professional rehabilitation measures, trying to find jobs for young and adult people. And I know how a counseling works regarding jobs. And uh, we have done 55 thousand counseling in different countries, uh, Kosovo, Albania, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, numbers from the government. But I have had a look at the numbers from Albania, and I saw that in two years, every day, 31 counseling talks were carried out. Every day. Do you know what that means to prepare somebody for a job and give him a counseling? You have to get to know that person which is not possible without a team of 100 people, it is not an easy task. You need to talk to that person. You need to get the information from GIZ. For example, there was a fair where different companies presented themselves and people just uh, started to talk to these people. But you can't say that this is a counseling talk. It doesn't work like that. To go back to your question, would it not be sensible to give uh, people a good advice on how to find a job? But it needs to be based on a concept that works, a society where 50, 60 percent are unemployed. You don't need to. Uh, help them to find jobs. The companies will always find the people they need. 
and they will just uh, choose them according to special criteria. And uh, rarely you can get into these jobs via qualification measures. So you're right. First, we need job creation. And then the vocational training comes, which also creates jobs. But it has to be done in a different way. Well, the turn is yours. The floor is yours now. We will just uh, collect some questions for the speakers. Please use a microphone. We need a microphone for the room. And there it is. <coughs> Otherwise, you can get ours. Thank you, Stefan Dünnwald uh, from the Bavarian Refugee Council Pro Azul. I would have a lot of questions. But there's one concrete question to Mr. Brown, and I spoke about it this morning. The voluntary people in Bavaria work with a lot of Senegalese people, helping them, accompanying their efforts to return to Senegal. And uh, they also help them to develop their own projects, creating their own companies. and. The day before yesterday, I heard that all those projects that you mention as very positive and that the GIZ also likes to talk about and show this cooperation with voluntary people, but that the company creations, uh, um, they try uh, promised a lot of money, but not a single cent has arrived. And I've heard uh, six or seven stories like that. I listened to it, and uh, it, uh, well, there were companies uh, which were quite sophisticated and well prepared, much uh, better than just uh, take care of goats. So, what is the credibility? If you speak about a program to create a perspective in the country of origin, if you talk to people who are here and want to convince them that they have a better perspective at home, because in the case of the Senegalese here and in Senegal, if there's nothing else than just some counseling, but no real measures are being implemented, I don't see that this program of creating a perspective in the homeland really can be successful. Some more questions. A question to Mr. Kalos, now that I have the microphone. This morning, I mentioned that I've got some numbers from, Bay, from the Bavarian Minister, Minister of the Interior. 200, some more people were repatriated. Uh, with uh, funding from the GAP program, and uh, 200 just left in 2018. I guess in 2019, uh, another uh, 200 will uh, leave with that program, but 1,000 disappeared. And I met some of them in Paris and Spain illegally. They just went on. These are only Afghans who were in Bavaria. If you just calculate uh, this enormous secondary migration, which is provoked in Bavaria, because Bavaria does not only repatriate, repatriate criminals, but has a very broad profile to create a fear uh, across the federal state. So I have some doubts if this is kind of a understandable migration policy. If 300 people are being taken back to the country of origin and more than 1,000 are pushed into illegal uh, and in illegal situation and uh, disappear in other EU countries, and uh, they have to take care of them. Okay, another question here, the lady on the left uh, side. And then afterwards, we have a second round. Anna Schwarz, Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brussels. I have a very brief question. We have talked a lot about migration, and discussed the issue, but Bente told us that we have to differentiate between migration and flight. And I would like to know what is the relationship, what's the proportion of uh, people who come to Germany or are in Germany who have fled to get a 
refugee status or protection status, and how many are here who don't get the status? And where do the Afghans end up in such a statistics that which must exist? Thank you. Right, we have another question up front. I have a question I tried to Heidi Malifat includes said that people after they return, Afghans who arrive at Kabul airport are received there and that there are reintegration measures. I would like to know from Heidi Malifat if we can confirm this. Thank you. Then we have a Brauner Fest regarding the question of that gentleman. I'm going to offer you to give me the information on these six cases, had to invite, and we can follow up on it. The Senegalese cases, it will matter individually what was agreed, what was discussed, and then I can explain in more detail. We are in a close exchange with the return in Bavaria. There's intensive male contact with various volunteers. We try to build up confidence indeed, sure. It would be a catastrophe if agreements were not heeded. But one has to check that out individually. I'm happy to be available. Herr Klaus, the second question was directed to you. People who march on within Europe. Briefly, yes, is the answer. The lengthy answer is why is rather, um, let me pick up what Wolf Scheller said, regarding escape, regarding flight, and this was what your question was addressed at. Since 2012, we have the term, have had the German resettlement program, which on top of resettling streams of refugees is another element of the German obligation vis-a-vis -vis people who have reasons to escape, like we discuss them and define them that other people have valid reasons to leave their home countries is uncontested. We have a differentiation between these that come from armed conflict, these that are politically motivated. They give a privilege over others that have no livelihoods, that have a shortage of livelihood. They want to go to Europe or to Germany to rebuild their lives. There's a clear statutory basic decision. You could change it. But that's something that the parliament would need to do for those, however. And sticking to the Afghans, um, Bavaria is not different from the other federal states. The Afghans that get a status, the residence is unjeopardized in Bavaria. It refers to those that under the process were rejected. And this is why Bavaria doesn't do anything else than enforcing valid law in order also to have acceptance for those that need protection to keep that acceptance in this country. Other can land of the Federal Republic should follow the example of Bavaria. You know, this is our system. Afghanistan is an extreme example, I agree, but we've got to live our own law. We've got to take it seriously. This is what I'm lacking in residence on, what I'm lacking in the debate, rather. We've got people who, from scratch, visibly have no reason to come here. We're guaranteeing them a process. They get a ruling from the bump agency. In most cases, it will be negative. Uh, and half of those, that's you. Afghanistan is different. There are federal states, or there are states where there are reasons for protection. And it's difficult to find out who is who. And then the bump will decide in favor of a particular person. But the judge that reviews it, because responsibility is very big, I mean, mind you, the individual decision maker takes a hard decision. It's a decision about life or death. You don't easily take that decision. You responsibly take it for those that are rejected under the procedure. It must be plain and clear to them. We've got to implement the law while we have a case that decides yes or no, residents in Germany, yes or no, then no is no. It must be no. That also refers to Afghanistan, where the preconditions are in place, and it has been checked. We've heard your reasoning about the law. The question is how many, there are so many successful suits against bump rulings. Half are right. Some take protection. The 100 people, 200 people, and 1,000 people, or 300 people, and 1,000 people that just go elsewhere, or you don't know where they go, that's a phenomenon. 
but sure, it is also part of a voluntary return. We propagate that, but it works better if there's a probability that valid law can be enforced, where there is a return in the end. Bavarian is Bavaria is more probable than in other federal states to be deported indeed, then this is an effect for people to leave Bavaria and go elsewhere as a logical consequence. And basic well, of a persistent migration policy, this is also wanted. Indeed, per year a thousand Afghans just from Bavaria move into illegality. This is wanted. I know people who are in Frankfurt or in Berlin and come from Bavaria. They're obliged to leave the country. They would be obliged. Partly, some of them do. They leave. We have findings about them moving abroad. It's not a standard thing, but it's a phenomenon of ordinary illegality. I mean, you can't deny that. Then again, let me follow up with a question. Talking about Afghans who are pushed elsewhere, let me get back to the numbers. What about when they come out of the airport? Who stands there and looks after the Afghans in Kabul airport? If I may actually take the opportunity to, uh, because a lot of issues have been mentioned and, and, and it requires some responses, um, uh, uh, because I realize Afghanistan and the integration and most importantly, uh, the counseling as a highlight of, let's say, the, the, the integration or reintegration policy has been mentioned here. Uh, first, certainly uh, as an Afghan and of course on behalf of the Afghan community sitting here or in Germany, uh, certainly we welcome, of course, you know, the, the initiative and the support that has been provided by Germany. This is something that we will remain thankful of that. And of course, by no means Germany could be also you know, compared with the neighboring country. And I'm very angry with you looking actually at the UK and their policy and how particularly they are promoting a sort of hostile environment that the refugees or the immigrants cannot even you know, stay for you know, a few months there. And of course, looking at Norway, looking at Sweden, that's totally different. That is completely acceptable. But nonetheless, you know, the expectation is also a lot you know, from Germany to get you know, things done in a right and a proper manner. And to start it actually with some facts and to, uh, with due respect, uh, um, that of course it's important, you know, when you talk about the statistics and number and looking at how, you know, this um, the security, let's say, situation and, and, and improves and, and of course uh, deteriorates. It is very difficult actually to base our assumption and sometime in also that serve as a basis for policy making, particularly looking at one you know, let's say the first quarter of the UN report, you know, to the civilian casualties. I have to also make a distinction that there is also needed. If you look at the first quarter report of the civilian casualties by the UN put, yes, overall there has been a decrease in civilian casualties, but also there has been a lot of increase with the casualties of children and women that we talk. And that means a lot of men that actually they are not over there, and it is the children and it's the women that left there, and as a result of the conflict, it's the women and children that they get killed. And the second half, of course, the 2009 report that we have seen, all of us, we see a 40% increase, 40% increase you know, compared to last year, and that means a lot, yes. And even if you look, actually, the first time the threshold, and that was set, 10,000 casualties per year, has been crossed in 2014. Since 2014, if you look at actually the graph, it has never ever, you know, like decreased. It has always like, uh, uh, you know, arised and, and, and increased. And we have every year more civilian casualties. And mean, that means more intense situation, more, you know, more escalating conflict, you know, that is happening. And as a result, you know, people will not, you know, that's not the option. And I have to also mention that you know the new study that has been done, uh, is, has been done, and of course this is a question that asks to you know by region I would be more than happy to give you know the the statistics and number that why there is a still a strong likelihood of possibility for of course you know that they leave, and that has to do with the political security and economic situation, and it has to do with overall you know shrinking economy, and it has to do with the expanding, you know, corruption there. It has to do also with the criminal enterprises that is, you know, growing. So a number of factors that to be considered. That's why I'm saying, you know, that when it comes to integration policies, and I will keep it short, I think it has to address the realities on the ground. My 
you know, concern is here that there are a lot of policies that are adopted or made, and it is quite outdated. It does not respond to the necessary and the need, necessary, and needs of, of course, the migrants on the ground currently, because a lot of things has radically changed. I give you an example. We have been, of course, talking a lot of about the counseling. Fast. When you actually bring those traumatized people, you know, to a room to do counseling with them, it looks like actually you ask the people, you know, to brush your teeth three times a day and without eating for, you know, one time. So that is exactly their situation, you know. And the second time, because you know that they, you bring an Afghan traumatized person to actually do counseling with another traumatized person. When I myself attending a funeral of my relatives and friends, you know, three times in a month as a counselor how I can do actually counseling for the other people. I think this is, you know, has to be taken into consideration and looked at the big picture. What is, we are actually saying, you know, that it requires a policy revision, a policy rethinking, and of course revision here as well, you know, in Europe, but also back there. Here, when, you know, there is needed actually to catch up, basically with a lot of develop, new developments and new changes that are happening, and that has to be considered. You know, otherwise, you know, we're sending people basically to, 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 to the dead place, you know, that they have been killed. And already there is established a number of them, and many of them that we have also talked, they have, because they're young people, and they, they consider self-harm. A uh, few cases, you know, that, of course, the recent one happened now in Australia, and then, of course, we had cases in Afghanistan, you know, that they have uh, harmed themselves, and then now the more kind of tendency that they harm themselves when they are desperate, when there is nothing for them. Obviously, the only reason is, and because a lot of them are young, they cannot go back to their families. $40,000, as I mentioned, is a lot of money, you know, that they have taken from the family. The parents sold, you know, the house, in order to, you know, give it, the, you know, the money to the son to come here, and ultimately, you know, there will be a brighter future for them. But now, the, even the family that have, has a house is sold, and no longer, you know, he's able back to go to the family. So, and as a result, what he has to do, he has to actually either self-harm or go back, you know, to certain other countries in order to, you know, find this money and give it. So, therefore, you know, counseling is just, yes, it is fantastic, it's good, you know, but it is not all about what we talk about, you know. So there has to be other issues to be considered. I think job employment is one of the things that, you know, that often discussed here, that could be done. And the second thing is also to look beyond this issue that, that address the needs, the immediate needs of that, you know, the, 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 the deputy community. Yep, so. Th this was not an answer to the question yeah, because if Germany was there at the airport. <laughs> No, of course, this is, I, I also, I before mentioned, there, but this, this is in responses, you know, to some of other issues that mentioned. Well, uh, uh, that I had to somehow, you know, get yes, back to that. But could you maybe answer this conc very concrete question? You know, what assistance does Germany... Well, uh, as far as, I, of course, you know, this has to do with the IM, you know, that, of course, the International Counseling Service, you know, that they, the EPSO, uh, particularly through that, that it has been provided. But again, there is a lot of questions with the performance of the IM and with due respect to some of the colleagues from IM that's sitting here. I think IAM is one of the most, I, I would say, dysfunctional organization in Afghanistan. You know, this is, a lot of people could, uh, you know, like uh, agree with me, particularly those that they have gone through these processes, you know, with the IAM. The call center that they set up is not working and it is, uh, they're not responding to the needs of the people when there are 20 people ending up in a Kabul airport. And this is what I have been myself. First, of course, it's before a lot of other issues are involved. The moment that they arrive there, and the last penny that is still in their pocket is stolen by a border police, Afghan border police. So that's another trauma. So they have to pass. And then after that, so, and, and then you start calling and calling. Myself, the last time that I went from Istanbul, Turkey, 20 Afghans with me, we called five times IAM, and none of, none of them you know, showed up at the airport. And, and now, as, you, as, as some of you may know, that they delegated some of their tasks to an organization called Center for Excellence, and that they are doing some of this. But of course, again, if you, you know, colleagues from the different ministries, you know that this center has no further experience in dealing with that kind of situation. And again, the question is back to IAM. How come they know this organization? Why they didn't go for the organizations that they had better capacity, better human resource in place, and could deal with this crisis that we are dealing at the moment? But now a center that is just recently established and is a kind of part of you know, the kind of business enterprise and you give to them, and, and certainly the result is what we see today. Thank you for the insight. 
I'd like to collect a few more questions. I've not forgotten you, but let me put on the back burner the question about the numbers. We could find out differently. Let me collect what real need for information there is. I had three papers showing with a show of hands. We'll carry on the middle round and then three people over here. Floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to ask in English. It's about the GIZ and the I'm Rex Osa. I am a refugee activist in Germany and very much active in um, organizing returnees and deportees in Nigeria at the moment. And uh, my questions will go directly to the issue of GIS, which is connecting Mr. Brown and the Stabstelle for um, deportation, which Mr. Close is representing. Um, I think um, I will start, first of all, with your response um, with regards to the issue of supporting deportees. Um, on arrival. Right now, as we are talking, about 40 deportees arrived in Lagos airport, abandoned at the cargo airport, gate, thrown outside the gate, mothers and children. We have been able to accommodate some very few of them, those ones who have nowhere to go right now in the hotel close by. And then right now I had you saying that um, you try to support people from the spot of the um, the end station to their destination. I don't know if it's referring to only Afghanistan or it's a general process. So I would want you to respond to that question so I can know what to tell the Nigerian immigration in Nigeria if they are lying that they don't get nothing from the European Union. That's on one hand. And secondly, to this issue of deportation at the moment, I can see a kind of trend that yes, um, we are following this um, routine ritual in Germany. Every two years, there's a new process. We had the Bleiberecht Regelung. It comes to the Artfar Regelung. Now it's Ausbildung, Duldung. Every two years, it's a new game. And uh, I can see that the massive deportation to Nigeria right now is targeted at a lot of young Nigerians who are working for two, three, four years already in Germany who should have been qualified on the 1st of January 2020 for this so-called Ausbildung, Duldung. And now there's this massive trend to deport them out of Germany. So you have a very few persons who can be propagated as people who are successful. So I want you to respond to that because how do you see it? And you tag them as criminals, people who only did not submit their passport. You criminalize them because of um, issues, migration offenses. You make it look like big criminal offenses, which is the big stigma they are facing in Nigeria now. So I want you to think about it, how you see it. But I want you to also divert a, a little bit. I think I asked the question, where is the humanity? When we represent the state, Sometimes we should feel as human and at least give our own personal position on how we see things because we are the politicians, we are the people responsible, we are the ones who make policies. So if we try to claim that, yes, it's government issue, I have to represent my position, then the question is how do we change the situation? The secondly, to the issue of GIZ, I've been figuring out the um, process of the GIZ, so I'm asking this question. Is the GIZ only a Femitlung Stelle, or how do you call it, Femitlung? Like, yes, a Femitlung Stelle, with the way it looks like, because um, there's a lot of misinformation. The um, returning migrants, some of them feel that, I, um, that GIZ is giving them startup capital. I spoke with some GIZ officials also who said, yes, we give them a little bit of startup. Some of them feel they don't give. But how can you train people for like one year, you are giving them training. Like today, they started the training in Nigeria, um, business startup training. Traumatized people who are deported by force from Europe, dumped at the airport. They have no home. They sleep at the beach. They have no home where they keep their head. And you are training them two, three weeks later on business training. First of all, no psychological trick. A training that would at least bring them back to this situation to understand that they are back home. They are now starting off training for two weeks. Eh? And at the end of the day, it's going to be like this for the one next one year. So the question is, is this GIZ project really out there to really um, help the society or create a kind of more tense situation in Nigeria? Because to the, GIZ, yes. uh, the, to the GIZ specifically, 
um, why I ask if it's a Vermittlungsstelle. Um, I, think we, I think we got the point, actually. It's two okay. very important questions. Let, uh, let's have some time for them to answer okay. what you just uh, okay. talked about. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we will have two more questions and then you have the chance to answer. Entschuldigung, ja, auf Deutsch. Zwei weitere Fragen. Und two more questions and then we can let the speakers answer to them. Omeda Gandival, I've been working for years with refugees from Afghanistan in Berlin. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Glock, who always uh, referred to a right and order. And uh, I work with refugees and we get the notices of uh, refugee status denial. And since 2015, 2016, the government has changed their policies. A lot of negative notices were received. And if you read it, it's just like copy paste. Nobody really takes the effort to uh, explain what happens. So it was be good if you talk about that in your ministry. It's always the same kind of statement. These are young men and uh, sometimes there are also women. And those people who wrote it, uh, the decision makers, do not have much information about Afghanistan. If you ask people to Bamiyan if he is a Pashtun or a Hazara is being told to go to Halalabad, where he can't live, then you know there's no individual check of these cases. It's just about implementing a policy. And as a consultation center, we understand that the situation is as I mentioned it here. Secondly, if we speak about uh, those who don't show their identity, then we have to clearly state who is caught, uh, a person who does not want to show their identity, if these are people who don't have a birth certificate and no passport. And of course, the Afghan embassy is overwhelmed. They say, we can't give you a passport because you speak Persian, Farsi, because you were born in Iran. And then these people can't prove that they are Afghans. And then the migration office often says, well, Afghans always have these huge clans. They must have some relative in Afghanistan. It can't be that they haven't any. So this is a reality. And if you talk about law and order, then you also have to take into account the reality on the ground. It's not that the people don't want to show their identity. It's not possible with an Afghan government or gov an Afghan embassy which is completely overwhelmed with uh, the amount of work. So if you want to see how people do things in the administration, just go to the Afghan embassy and have a look if it's possible for the people to prove their identity. Well, we have a lot of people who want to speak, so I have to uh, just uh, also interrupt you there. Thank you very much for all your contributions. I want to talk about the GIZ because we have worked a lot in the migration field. Now, the problem that we have not talked about is that there are certain principles and also the German Development Corporation has to follow certain principles that we have to comply with. Now, on the one hand, there is a situation where an agreement re, uh, to return uh, migrants is contradictory to development cooperation. What happens with the aims of the Agenda 2030? What happens with the fact that the GIZ is meant to contribute to a reduction of poverty by 2030? And the aid and the support is, uh, has to be paid uh, according to the demand and not according to uh, German foreign policy interests. So I would like to hear your 
opinion as a representative of the development uh, ministry. The GIZ cannot be a foreign policy instrument, but this discourse has become quite commonplace now. Thank you very much. Who wants to answer to the Nigerian activist? Uh, there were several issues and all the, what happens with the deportees. Well, we can answer the question. There are more people coming. coming. Uh, 340,000 uh, asylum uh, procedures are being filed, and the returnees are less. Uh, I would rather say that I'm director of the returns directorate, which is a remarkable difference because it uh, includes both voluntary return and forced returns as well. And our preference is indeed voluntary return, and uh, the recognition rate of Nigerians is very low here in Germany. It's less than 10% at the moment. So the likelihood to get a status here is very low when you are from Nigerian origin. Uh, having said that, uh, voluntary return is the preferred choice, and there are additional programs, voluntary return programs, which gives you some assistance. Uh, you can look at returningfromgermany.de uh, for further details. Uh, but there is, we have made a distinction between those who return voluntarily, who can benefit from these programs on the one hand, and on the other hand, those who are forcefully uh, returned to their countries of origin. And uh, here the, comes a difference. There's uh, one incentive, if, you, if I may say so, or some, some option left for those who are being returned forcefully, and these are the reintegration programs. And this concerns both at national level but also at EU level. If it comes to Nigeria, um, Nigerians, uh, even removed uh, Nigerians, uh, qualify also for the European Return and Reintegration Program, and uh, information is available already here in in Germany, but also on the spot in Nigeria. I don't know. I don't think that we have it in Nigeria yet. For Ghana, we are currently uh, looking at something like a welcome desk uh, from the European Union, so that uh, returnees can immediately appear there upon arrival and get uh, further assistance and they are not simply uh, left alone uh, with uh, uh, yeah, uh, their destiny. As regards those being here uh, and going through all the procedure, yes, it's true, it, it, it takes sometimes two or three years, but this is due to the procedure, because you are applying for asylum and you also take advantage of, of the legal remedies which are available for you. So, and, and uh, due to the uh, exhaustion of resources uh, at the administrative courts, then you have an issue here. It takes then two or three years. Yes, of course, we do not want, and this is the idea of, of the of the Tages Strukturierende uh, Maßnahmen, daily structurized uh, 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 yeah, activities at the anchor, uh, as we call them, uh, at the facilities for, for the reception of asylum seekers to give uh, young people something useful uh, to do. Uh, but this uh, takes place here. And some of them, indeed, they do a major integration effort, and already today there are possibilities for legalization. Uh, and, and you're right, we have uh, every two or three years uh, um, a discussion on, on legalization, but I think this has uh, come to a certain end with the, with the uh, latest legal changes, because already three years ago we have uh, made a, a, a legalization possibility um, which is not dependent on a, on, on a deadline. So criminalization, the criminalization of people who have... No, no, they, they are looked at, they oh, are yes, stigmatized no. in their countries of origin because... So this is different. I mean, most of the Nigerians uh, come from Edo State, as you mentioned. Uh, they, they return uh, to Lagos. Uh, we also looked into this. We are, uh, also uh, spoke with them. Yes, this phenomenon exists. Of course, this the same as, as, uh, as you have mentioned, that uh, enormous investments have been made uh, to make actually this move uh, towards uh, Europe, and uh, apparently uh, this investment is somewhat wasted. Uh, this is some, this is a conflict which I cannot resolve and also not re, cannot be resolved by, by voluntary return programs or reintegration programs. Um, so, 
I, I think it's goes been far, but I mentioned the website, returningfromgermany.de. If you enter uh, Nigeria, yes, you will find all uh, details. Uh, should I really uh, spell all the things down which are available for Nigerians uh, now here? I don't think it's the time. So we have this availability, and there's also return counseling available. Okay, ich glaube, das können wir jetzt But nicht. Aber vielleicht können Sie das gleich nochmal, maybe you can talk about it after yeah, sure, the, sure, the discussion. Sure. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, vielleicht Afghanistan. noch zu den Identitätstäuschern. Yeah. Um, well, something about Af Afghanistan and those who pretend to have a different identity. We have Punjabis, uh, people from India who want to be recognized as Afghans and they are interested in not openly show their real identity. It's not a huge number, but it does happen. And in the case of Syrians, the same thing happened where the recognition rate is very high. You get people who just uh, pretend to be certain citizens with uh, false identities. The situation that you described can happen. The legislator also reacted in the law of an ordered return. It is possible for people who can't prove their identity that they can show and prove that they did every effort possible to prove their identity. And if they speak uh, uh, the language and if they uh, have uh, family members who can help, it is possible to get a normal uh, short-term permit, a tolerated permit. That is possible in the framework of the law of controlled return. About the Nigerians, uh, it says, okay, if I speak German, we don't play, uh, pay global sums. It is not that uh, everybody gets the same uh, money or cash uh, at our centers. That is a misunderstanding. And uh, therefore, it is very important to have a counseling about the return already in Germany, what is being paid and what is not. Uh, being done. There's a lot of misinformation and uh, therefore we have an online page where you can get some information, get in contact with those centers. But it's very important to understand that there is no global payment of any uh, money in cash. If we support the creation of companies, it's linked to a business plan and to a training. And it is not cash on arrival. Regarding GIZ, well, uh, as uh, I want to mention that the Nigerians have the virtual counseling to make some advertisement for that process. So people who are already in Nigeria, they can get counseling. So they have possibilities to, count, uh, to get counseling. Maybe we should just talk about uh, these uh, possibilities uh, afterwards. Well. We think we are in accordance with the Agenda 2030. There's a point uh, 10, uh, seven about um, controlled and responsible migration. And then our activities happen in this context. Migration needs to be organized. There's a circulatory migration, 360 degree migration return as part of this process. Now. In my unity, I deal with this topic. There is a migration compact, as you know, and the Article 21 says that return and reintegration is part of a migration process. That means that this is the basis for our work. Of uh, the basis uh, are these two international documents, and the development cooperation has been done a lot more than just uh, fighting poverty has a broader variety of topics, and I think this is a correct uh, approach. Now, we don't think that we are a foreign policy instrument, but we consider ourselves to be part of the policies of the German government. So we have to adhere to German legislation, and therefore we also support return policies with our instruments of development cooperation in our partner countries. We are not an NGO of the 
uh, Ministry of Development. We are part of the German government. So for us, a co coherent approach, a coordinated policy approach is the basis because migration and reintegration is such a complex task which requires this kind of coordination and cooperation. I could give you a lot of examples. Well, we don't have that much time. I could give you examples that only through cooperation among public and non-public uh, actors we could uh, organize this complex process. So my question is, do we have time for another question round? Well, there are three questions which are very urgent to the lady, and I promised you to admit two more questions. One, two, three. I would like to ask you to be brief and also ask for brief answers so we, that we can manage in the last eight minutes. I try to be brief. I don't know if I can manage to do so. Mr. Close, in my view, your effort to maintain and implement uh, existing laws is something that I share. I think that a constitutional state is a huge achievement, and it can only continue to be a state where the rule of law is ensured at all levels if it implements the rules. On the 2nd of October, I was in Moria on Lesbos, and this experience has deeply undermined my belief in a system that is meant to implement uh, human rights completely and destroyed it. And I can only, from the bottom of my heart, ask you to, to take up your responsibility as a person, as a human being, as a decision maker and a responsible person to fulfill this task in the best way possible to mm, maintain and not lose these achievements uh, which uh, required uh, two world wars. And I think it's, we are in a very, very critical moment and we have to pay attention at what kind of rights are being implemented with what kind of means. Because if we lose our, our heart, if we don't take serious our own fundamental values, who are we then? Thank you very much. That uh, was uh, understood as a call. Thank you. Another question over there. Hello, Saratitsa. I want to say something to the Afghan. Uh, I clarify a few things. Um, IOM didn't delegate anything to ACE. Uh, ACE took over the ARIN program from IOM. ARIN is a rather not so good program, sorry I have to say that. It's a bit dysfunctional and it's not very appropriate. That's why IOM does not implement ARIN globally. We gave this program away because it doesn't work well enough according to our standards and ACE took it over in Afghanistan and I know it's dysfunctional and it's not the fault of ACE, it's the fault of the ARIN program, so don't blame ACE. Yeah, just, I, we can speak later on bilaterally, but just to clarify this. Uh, then I want to say yes, people are received at the, Kab uh, at the Kabul airport. I was there in April when a charter flight landed from Berlin. So I was a witness, I also spoke to deportees uh, that came uh, from this flight. There's IPSO specifically that provides psychosocial support and they do a very good job. Some of the counselors uh, have been deported themselves from Germany, so they know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, IOM is also there. Um, there is uh, cash given out to deportees. It's not a large sum, it's just a sum that is supposed to support them over the next days. Yeah? Um, and this is all done under the watchful eye also of the German embassy and uh, security people. So I think it is rather transparent. Maybe it wasn't like that always, there could be, but I think at the moment it's rather transparent. And as you rightfully said, people are deported from Turkey. They receive no support, also not from IOM, because unfortunately we are projectized and there is no, no project that helps us to support these people. There are large, large numbers. And uh, you are perfectly right uh, to mention this. And I think this is what happens if nobody supports deportees. And I want to give this a bit back to this room. 
I know you see this critically if you work with deportees, but is it good to dump people, as the person said, uh, the refugee activist in Nigeria, and nobody is there to give even basic support or even some psychosocial help, as IPSO does in Afghanistan, and I think they do a stellar job. They're not IOM, they're IPSO. I think they do a stellar job. I think it is better to support these people with basic services after their deportation. You might think it's a bit dirty, but I think it is important. So, Vielen Dank. Ja. No, thank you very much. Die letzte Frage noch von dem Herrn dort hinten und dann machen wir eine. Last question of the man over there and then we give the floor to the speakers. My name is Mustafa. I am from Afghanistan. I'm studying in Berlin and I would like to make a comment uh, regarding the cynical call of Mr. Kloss that other federal states should uh, take up the example of the inhumane migration policy of Bavaria. If you want to insist on uh, the, the rule of law and uh, the legislation, I understand that's correct, but the refugee policy in, in Bavaria is very inhumane. Dozens of people were just taken from their professional uh, uh, training center, were taken away, and many civilians uh, tried to prevent that. If you uh, uh, support such a policy, it's a shame for you. My question, you said this year or last year in June you were in Afghanistan. I would like to know if you talked on the ground with detainees or returnees who found a job or ha can imagine to have a new perspective in the short term and if that and it was not the case. What was the purpose of your visit in Kabul? Edith hat Entschuldigung, das ganz kurz. Moment, Moment. Just a second. You can discuss that later on. We have reached the end of the discussion. The lady. Save the children. Thank you for picking up my comment or question. At this junction, I'd like to remind you that it's not only adults that are affected by return, be it voluntary return or repatriation, but also children. Often, they're ignored as the objects in that whole process when they travel as an annex to their parents. Looking at the parameters of the UN Convention for Children, the well-being and the welfare of the child should be borne in mind in any step of the return process. I would propagate this and recommend that this shall not be ignored. And Marifat, answering the Afghanistan question, maybe. Madam, uh, well, I think there are two things to say, and without making actually this one so personal and monologue, I would say. Uh, first, I think if we start defending, you know, these organizations, you know, such as IAM, and of course I understand it, and they are doing a tough and difficult job, I don't think that we reach somewhere else unless we tackle the problem and we see the problem and that is out there. And it's not just me saying that one. I certainly wish, you know, and I hope when you are there actually, besides seeing those people, you know, that you have come to the Kabul airport, you have also seen those people you know, that they are queuing behind the IM gate over there. Maybe it could have helped, helped a lot, you know. Because when you are there, when there is a foreigner and somebody from the embassy, that makes a lot difference, madam, than sending the other people. And how arrogant they are and how they behave with this poor, you know. No matter, you know, I'm not just talking about the people and of course because you have a project over there and that it is that, you know, the people coming from Turkey is not covered, you know, and, and benefited from that. But I'm talking from the people that are deported from Europe, you know, from other places. And it's something that I had looked into the shoe for many times and we had communicated, okay? So the question is very much about them. It's not about, you know, like, I'm not talking about IOM internationally. So probably the best office we have in Germany, in Berlin, but that's not the case over there, you know, because they do not do what they are supposed to do over there. The services that they have to provide, the explanation that they have to do it, and the human behavior, which is at least that is expected, that's not done there. Second thing, on the APSO, I know MK for many years, personally. You know, from long, long time, you know, the, the, the woman from Germany that has been serving in the country, and when she first arrived, 
I, I knew him since that time. And I have a lot of respect for her. And some of my close friends are actually working in that organization. Two of them are now in my own organizations that they're working and served in that. So there's no question about that. What I'm actually saying, yes, counselors, even from Germany, that they have been here and they're deport, deported you know, back to the country. The question is about when the people themselves are subjected and, and, and undergone that kind of situation, do they themselves, you know, need assistance or what they can they provide assistance to other people? It is a big question that we have to make a distinction because these people themselves require assistance. And I think either it's IPSO or somebody has to first tackle their own problem, you know, first address their own needs and issues. So this is exactly the one that we are talking that that has to be made a distinction. When I say you trained a lot of Afghan, first of all, I have to make it very short, in a way. Historically, you know, the service of psychocounseling is absent. It is not even in our mentality. I would say it. Even if you come in thousands of times do counseling for me, for me it's not working. Let me be honest to you. It's the, the, how some Afghans are here because we do not believe in that because that is not part of our culture and that has not been there for many years. It's completely absent. And it's because of the fatigue that we have, you know, because of the war. 30 years of war we have this experience and as a result the resilience and the fatigue that we have. So it's not working on our mentality. You know, that's one thing that I have to say. So it has to be seriously questioned. And when those people that they themselves do not believe in counseling themselves, how they can help other people. I myself went through seven times, you know, counseling session. None of them proved to be helping me because I was two times close to attack. And I was actually having that problem myself. But it didn't help. I have to take medicine. You know, that's something, you know, that I can tell you. Sorry to say, you know. Okay, vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Jetzt haben wir noch, Herr Kloos hat vielleicht... Uh Thank you much. Herr Kloos, final comment. This appeal was very impressive. I'd like to turn that into a question. What does the federal government do to remedy the shaming circumstances on the Greek islands? What does the um, government do to improve things? The idea was to have rule of law on Greek islands, swift decisions for people to be accepted or to be sent back or to be distributed throughout Germany and uh, sorry, Europe. Early 2016, it has not worked. Turkey does take people back, but none of them is taken into the European Union. That was the basic thought in the second part that did not get implemented. We pay money to Turkey that they keep refugees. Now Erdogan wants to open it again. More people come on the Greek islands. What do you do for the people that arrive in the Greek islands? I have understood the appeal that I need to, I want to respond. I also understand your excitement. Yes, the cooperation with Greece has had some time where the circumstances have not necessarily improved. This was not on account of German assistance promises. My minister, and this was just criticized, but the guiding principle of humanity and order is trying to be implemented. Just a few weeks ago, he was, and days ago, he was in Greece. My minister, we repeatedly addressed it at the European level and on bilateral level. We've asked on Greece, we've offered them support, we've called on them to act. The support work offered is not taken as they could have done. And this is also because of Greece, that they're a sovereign state. There were plenty of appeals on the part of European partners, and it was not successful to implement the Turkey Agreement, the accord as it was laid out, that speedy processes would be undertaken on the islands and that a return of people without a claim to protection can be made. This does not happen. I think around 2,000 people who were who returned in the scope of this, and different from what you say, 24,000 people indeed were taken over by European countries in the scope of the Turkey Accord. Actually, it was meant to be a one-to-one -one mechanism, but basically the European Union has taken many more need, people in need of protection than those protected, uh, as I suggested by the UNHCR from Syria. Yes, we are back. After the minister's visit, there is follow-up work. We carry on. BUMF has made concrete suggestions how to support the Greek asylum authority. We hope that Greek will accept, Greece will accept that offer. And that was the question. I'm sorry, we cannot hear her without a microphone. Apologies from the interpreters. A 
apologies from the interpreters. We have no sound input. We have no sound input. Maybe I can respond. The Greek side keeps saying travel passports are required. Things are required. Like demanding a passport is like demanding a driving license from a three-year-old. You just can't do that. I can only beseech you. Do what, as a human, you can do as a person on this earth. For over a year, the children have been in a state. That cannot be the European Union. Of course, what about that case? The media covered it. You remember that the refoulement agreement with the Greek side, which I negotiated in that context, and so far, mostly these were Dublin cases, Dublin family reunion cases, where basically the Greek side should create and does not accomplish the legal precondition for Germany taking over. But Germany took about 3,000 cases, and Germany was willing to take over those cases. Meanwhile, at short notice, that has been covered and accomplished. There are further cases. Well, let's not forget. In DNA, it's without dispute. Nobody will seriously dispute the DNA. Often, we don't have the DNA expert opinions. It's an illusion to demand certain documentation, but without any documentation, without any proof, it's quite plausible that children are tempted or try to be gotten across to make family reunion possible for understandable reasons that there is a check is clear. There must be a verification that's close to reality. What I'm saying is there is an abuse. There is a potential for abuse. I'll carry on after the uh, one follow-up. I'm not ashamed at all. Well, Germany gives protection to many Afghans who need protection. I'm proud of that, I can honestly say. But back to maintaining our legal order, not only the acceptance in this room, where we have lots of like-minded people with a view to pro-refugee action. I must say it matters that we implement it. What do I do in Afghanistan? I went there. I also negotiated the joint declaration as an implementation committee. We meet every, other, every half year, the Afghan government and us. And that's why at least once a year I'm in Kabul. I also accompanied a return flight. I wanted to see what the processes are, how do they handle people, how to deal with them. And I was at the airport of Kabul. I see the reception. There's no uh, German embassy people trying to shock people or to terrorize people. I mean, Afghans return to their home. Some go back home. They leave the airport after being registered. It is the case. They go back to families. That's what colleagues on site have told me. They partly, and they're not all from Iran, mind you. There are also people who come from Afghanistan. Some are picked up by family members. Some just walk home. Uh, they don't use all these assistance options that are open for everybody. There was an atmosphere that's ensured by the refugee ministry. People are not bullied. It's also ensured by IPSO and IOM that people can speak up and receive support to the extent that they have the precondition for their doing so. It's not that negative as you've described it. That's obvious. Thank you. We'll stick it. It's 10 past 9. We, have, we are outside the time. We've run out of time. Thank you for being here. Maybe we can agree that migration should be shaped in such a way that no return counseling is needed because people give are given instruction in their countries of origin. What regular cases now for circular migration that nobody would be received here illegally to file for asylum, that it doesn't get granted to be returned, to be reintegrated, that would be desirable. If we get to a point that we don't need that, that requires different migration policy. This has been one aspect of the discussion. Thank you very much for coming. And of course, all the open questions can be discussed with the other panelists here. Thank you for coming. <laughs>